first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. And just I just want to say that you're seeing me here tonight, but I'm not here for me. I'm not even here for all of you. I'm here for the people that are behind me. That's the farm workers that do the hard work that we work for every day to try and get justice for farm workers. So hopefully this will be an eye-opening experience and a transformative experience. And with that, we'll start out with the video. So, um, so thank you. And um, I really welcome discussion and thoughts. And I'm going to re relate this to our, the whole discussion about climate change. So lights, camera, action. <laughs> The projection that has Florida in the world is that it is Mickey Mouse, it is Miami Beach, it's all these beautiful people, but nobody sees the, the, the inside of Florida. Florida is the second largest producer of fruits and vegetables in the United States. And all that work, all that production and fruits and vegetables is being done by people from Central America and Mexico. Hay que estar todo el tiempo agachado y es muy pesada también cargar un bote de 13 galones y con el peso del sol y se da cuenta. So the Here Solace study is a study that we've been doing in Florida for the last four years. So we want to find out how does working in the fields, being exposed to heat, how does that really affect a worker physiologically? And with these workers, we wanted to see, will they take a core temperature pill? And that will let us know what their temperature is throughout the whole workday. Will they wear equipment to show us their activity? Will they wear a heart rate monitor, like the ones that runners and athletes often wear? And will they come and see us and, and let us have their blood and urine samples so that we can really get a whole physiologic profile of what's going on in their bodies while they're at work? Because once we have that starting point, then we can know, well, wh what's our current state? And then where do we need to go to make sure that over time we're all adapting to heat and making sure that we keep our workers as healthy as possible. Y es un estudio en el que estamos midiendo el efecto del calor en los trabajadores agrícolas, pero específicamente viendo cómo afecta sus riñones. Most people in the United States don't know where their food comes from. They have no appreciation. It just drops into the grocery store and, and there it is. And I think that's what struck me having come done a lot of occupational health research, the fact that we could have this invisible workforce. A lot of people don't realize that most vegetables, at least part of the whole crop, are hand-picked. Citrus is hand-picked. You know, strawberries are hand-picked. And they got to do it by, by the bucket, not the hour. So you'll see them in the fields running back and forth, physically, literally with a 40-pound bucket, running to the truck because they get paid by the bucket all day long in the heat, in the rain, in the mosquitoes, it doesn't matter what it is, but they do it by hand. There's a large section of the population here in the States that will not do that job for any amount of money. Name the price and you won't do it. You do one day and you would quit. We need them. We need, you know, it's just, it's tough out there. My name is Jesus. I come from the state of Tabasco, Mexico. I came 17 años. Las personas que venimos, como ella, yo, los vecinos, X personas, vienen aquí a trabajar. Desde hace dos años y medio aproximadamente, estábamos trabajando en una nursery. Realmente lo duro ahí, el calor agobiante que hay aquí. A veces, La temperatura ambiente está favorable porque corre la brisa, nuestros cuerpos se refrescan un poco más, pero las condiciones de trabajo son verdaderamente, en el campo son verdaderamente duras. Mire, me estoy tomando mi tiempo para poder platicar con usted. They come before work and they have a blood, blood test done and a urinalysis done and we also put equipment on them that measures their core body temperature and their physical activity and how hot the temperature is around them. And once they're done working, they come back to the office and again we do a urinalysis, blood test. We 
we found that in our sample, there's an association between heat, or heat index in this case, and acute kidney injury. So the key indicator that we were looking for in the study was core body temperature. So the physiologic limit that we were using was 38.0 degrees Celsius. Over 80% of our workers that we studied on at least one study day exceeded that physiologic limit. That puts you at a Fahrenheit temperature of 100.4. This core body temperature rise, this fever, it puts stress on the body. So it's kind of like, well, what would it be like for you to have a fever every day of your life you know, for some portion of the day? ¿Qué son las enfermedades por calor? Bueno, nosotros pensamos que esta es una buena analogía de lo que es una enfermedad por calor. ¿Qué es lo que está pasando con ese carro? Ahí los hombres deben de decir, ah, oh, pues, ¿qué le pasó a ese carro? Se sobrecalentó, ¿verdad? Ese carro se sobrecalentó. Eso es lo que son las enfermedades por calor también. Nuestro cuerpo se sobrecalentó. I've been working for the Fire Workers Association of Florida for 13 years. We are doing the trainings in the same communities where we collect the data. So even many of the participants of these trainings are, are participants of our, our research. So this, they, it's a reflection of their own reality. I think that bringing that into the training really make an impact. Preguntó, ¿dónde está el agua? Y le dijeron, ahí está la, ve, estoy, me siento mal, ve a tomar agua. Lo mandaron a, a, a tomar agua y el señor se pasó de donde estaba el agua y ya después lo encontraron muerto eh, adelante de donde estaba el agua. Pero cuando no le pagan por hora, pues uno tiene que ir a la carrera, toma menos agua. Cuando uno va más a prisa, también genera calor. Entonces, por eso son muchas cosas lo que hace que los trabajadores agrícolas sean 20 veces más en peligro de tener, de, de fallecer por calor que los trabajadores de otras industrias. Que las enfermedades por calor se pueden prevenir. No tiene por qué la, las personas morir. Está en, su propia, en sus propias manos el decir, voy a parar y no voy a, no voy a, a, a seguir. I do not think anybody should have to worry about their work and being safe at work and, and, and getting sick because of their work. So I think that with heat, um, there's a lot more potential to work with employers to make their workforce safe. You are a nursery grower producing plants. Are your workers considered farm workers or not? Yes, they are. We don't have that in mind when they say you need to rest. You need maybe your workers need to take some uh, breaks or they need to hydrate. But now we have the data to actually prove why is that important. I believe like a lot of the challenges that come to them is not because they don't want to implement all these safety guidelines, but it's because they are not aware of the risks they involve. Where the work has gone is we started off with surveys and then we started to do comprehensive heat biomonitoring so we'd actually be able to see um, what's going on physiologically with the workers so that from there we can plan some sustainable interventions for heat because as we know it's not going to be going away and we just have to figure out the ways to have, keep everyone healthy and productive in the meantime so that's what the work's about. You're benefiting everyone. You're benefiting the employee that's receiving this training. You're benefiting the manager that is understanding how to provide the best safety guidelines for the employee. You're benefiting also the company that is increasing in production, you're benefiting a local and regional industry and economy as well. The Farm Worker Association has in the past been successful at bringing employers to the table. Um, and especially with the Ag Center, we hope that we can get more employers at the table to work on practices that lead to a healthier and more productive workforce. Where we could start is just making sure that we have certain resources at the sites. Cool, fresh water to drink, bathrooms, that are comfortable and clean for workers, and also places that are in the shade where workers can take breaks that aren't so far from the work site that they couldn't use them regularly. I think as a society, we need to believe in a culture of health for everybody, um, that health is a right that we all have. 
independent of your class status, independent of your legal status. As a nurse scientist, I want to make sure that the research that we do is meaningful because research by itself is just some data. If people don't get the message about the work, then nothing's going to happen from it. Ellos sufren demasiado calor, más calor que nosotros porque ellos están en la viva tierra que está calientísima y agachándose demasiado, de veras, para ellos que cultivan las frutas que yo también compro, les agradezco. Que los jardines que tienen ellos son de estas manos que salen. Debe de ver para las personas que trabajan en el campo un poquito más de sensibilidad, un poquito más de respeto. So climate change is real, and it's getting hotter every summer, every year, and farm workers are working in these hot conditions so that the rest of us can have food to eat. You could see from this film, this was taken in hot conditions, and you could see how the farm workers were dressed. You know, when we go outside when it's hot, we have very little clothing on because it's, you know, we want to wear shorts and short sleeve shirts because it's so hot outside. But the farm workers have to dress like that because they have to protect themselves from pesticide exposure so they have their bodies covered. They have to protect themselves from the heat so that they don't get sunburned. And they protect themselves from the elements, from rain, from soil, from bugs. So not only is it really hot outside, but then they have to wear clothing like that to protect themselves. And this is so that the rest of us can have food to eat every single day. I want to start out by, hopefully I can do this. Um, I want to start out by talking a little bit about climate change. Which one do I press here? Is that one? Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about climate change and agriculture, because when most people think about climate change, they think about, you know, um, car emissions or energy generation. But I want to say that what most people don't think about is that, that agriculture is the number, and agriculture and our entire food system is the number one contributor to climate change in our country. Not, uh, so this, sorry about that, this, is, this was for a different presentation. Um, but um, agricultural, it, from, from um, animal feeding lots, where methane is, um, so livestock alone contributes about 18% of CO2 emissions. Um, and agriculture produces more CO2 than all the car emissions and transportation that we talk about every day. So we need to be aware of what our agricultural system is doing. It's the largest global industry with 1.3 billion people's, people globally. And you can see how much money is the agri agricultural system is producing every year. Um, it's 40% of our, um, our bio capacity for the earth. And just before I came here today, somebody sent me an article by Vandana Shiva. Do you all know who Vandana Shiva is? If you don't know, you've got to read Vandana Shiva. Oh my God, she's an absolute hero. And if you want to, I can send you the article if you want to sign up on our list. But she talks about how food, um, our food system, we are completely destroying our food system by all the, by trying to look for technological fixes. So people are trying to address climate change and agriculture by finding technological fixes to this, but we're going in the wrong direction. We need to go in the other direction and get back to basics. So um, we're, we're using up our biodiversity by land grabs, by deforesta deforesting um, millions of acres of land for agriculture, 
and that's the wrong way to go. But it also presents, whoops, it also presents the biggest opportunity. So our current system of agriculture is petroleum intensive. It's focused on exports, so you hear all this talk about the tariffs now. Well, in the United States, farmers, conventional, traditional, industrial farmers, not, not the small-scale farmers, but big commodity crop farmers are overproducing. So they want you know, national or international trade deals because they want to sell their produce in other countries because they're overproducing for this country. So they want these big trade deals so that they can send their products overseas. But look at the environmental damage that our current agricultural system is doing. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for our health, and it's bad for farm workers. So there's something structurally wrong with our entire system of agriculture. Um, this is really key. So in our country, when we think about agriculture, we think about you know, big farms. And one thing that's really interesting is that when I first started working for the Farm Worker Association, I heard the term specialty crops. And I'm like, specialty crops? You know what specialty crops are? They're the stuff that we eat all the time. The things that are the best for you, tomatoes, broccoli, lettuce, those are considered specialty crops because our industrial agricultural system looks at commodity crops as being the most important. And that's like corn that's used for ethanol and for animal feed and soybeans and cotton and wheat, the things that most of us don't eat every day. They're not our healthy fruits and vegetables that we're supposed to eat, but those are the commodity crops and those are the ones that our entire economic system, in, uh, agricultural economic system in this country is based on. So, so what, what, we're to, what our, the Farm Worker Association says is that farm workers are really just displaced farmers. And people don't think about that, but most people that come here to do farm work actually came from their home countries in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico. And what did they do in their home countries? Most of them worked on the land. But they couldn't survive, partly because of trade deals that destroyed agriculture in their home country. So they come to this country and they live and work in abusive conditions in our industrial, technological, conventional, uh, uh, chemically dependent system of agriculture. So, um, so our industrial food system degrades the soil, um, destroys genetic diversity, it poisons the bios biosphere, and it in includes lethal toxins. So for most of my time working at the Farm Worker Association, I actually worked on pesticide health and safety issues, and I could talk for a long time about that, but I'm not gonna do that right now. I'm happy to take questions afterwards because the whole issue of pesticides is really, um, really serious for farm workers, but for all of us. And um, one of the questions that we have is what happens to farm workers when they're both stressed from heat exposure, but then they're also exposed to pesticides? And that's one thing we want to look at. So more than 50% of all grain in the United States goes to livestock feed. Um, and which one contributes more to global warming? The key to your car or your fork? And most people don't think about that. They think about we're trying to reduce car emissions, right? But if you look at our entire agricultural system, it's actually a much bigger contributor to climate change. So um, the grain needed to feed every one of the people on the earth who dies of hunger is 12 million tons. If we quit using all this land to grow feed for animal agriculture and for ethanol and, again, and transformed it into small farms that grew organically and that grew healthy food, we could help to transform the agricultural system. It's crazy, yeah, it's crazy. Okay, um, so yeah, it accounts for uh, um, a 16, and actually I've seen figures that are much larger than this. Some figures show that the, uh, our agricultural system contributes up to 40 to 50% of um, the climate change greenhouse gases. And that's if you look at both um, animal feeding lots, the CAFOs, confined animal feeding lots, like the you know, um, um, uh, um, hog farms and um, uh, dairy farms um, and cattle, um, but also um, 
that it also includes um, the land grabs, but transportation and all the money that goes into transportation of tra transporting food from one place to the other. So, and this is, yeah, that's what this is. So the average um, food item consumed in the United States travels about 1,500 miles, except if you buy from fleet farming, and you have fleet farming uh, produce, which is really awesome, and you have your own community gardens. So what does all this mean for farm workers? How does this connect with farm workers, okay? Well, our agricultural system, like they said in the film, except for your large commodity crops that are mostly mechanized, like corn and soybeans and cotton, that's mostly mechanized. But the stuff that's most important for us to eat, the good healthy stuff, okay, that's all hand harvested. And it's farm workers that have to harvest them. And some people don't even know the difference between a farmer and a farm worker. Well, farmers are the people that own the land and own the business, and they're generally the ones that are making the money. Although that's a whole other issue right now because farmers are sque squeezed now also because of our really bad agricultural policies in this country. Um, but farm workers today, a lot of them are um, from other countries, although historically most farm workers in this country actually were African American. And I want to get into this a little bit. I'm not sure what the next slide is. Yeah, so um, yes. So they're mostly vulnerable, disenfranchised people from um, low-income minority communities. But one of the reasons that our agricultural system is so flawed is because it's based in systemic racism. In, 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 the first, in the first farm workers in this country, in the Southeast, were enslaved people that came over here from Africa. And it's really important to understand that deep systemic institutional racism that is at the basis of our entire agricultural system. Because farm workers were enslaved people and if you look at, let me see what the next slide is. Um, I'm going to come to that in a minute. But if you look at our laws and policies, in the, I'm going ahead of the slide, so um, this is more important. Um, if you look at our policies in the United States, in the 1930s, the US Congress passed labor laws. The Fair Labor Standards Act, um, the National Labor Relations Act, and two classes of workers were deliberately and intentionally excluded from those labor laws. And those classes of workers were farm workers and domestic workers. Bless you. Does that ring any bells to anybody? What did slaves do on plantations? Exactly. They did farm work and domestic work. So it was no accident that farm workers and domestic workers were deliberately, intentionally excluded from labor laws that protect all other workers. So when we think about agriculture and we think about our food system and we think about one of the major contributors to climate change in our country that affects our environment and our health and our health of our farm workers, we have to look at something really deep and systemic in our country and that deep and systemic issue in our country is racism, colonialism, and exploitation. So we're going to get deep because you can't really think about these things because our climate change crisis now is related to capitalist, colonialist, racist policy that brought us to where we are today. So... Um, Yes, okay, so where am I? Um, yeah, so um, race is the most significant predictor of a person living near a contaminated site. Okay, so I'm not going to get into this too deep because I'll talk too long. But for the past 22 years, I've worked with a group of, um, of farm workers that um, live in the Apopka area and that were contaminated by pesticides on Lake Apopka. It's called environmental racism 
because this community is exposed not only to pesticides where they worked, but there's a medical waste incinerator, there's three landfills, there's a municipal wastewater facility and a sewage treatment plant and plastics manufacturing industries all in the same low-income minority black, Hispanic, and Haitian community. And that's environmental racism. And right now, it affects mostly, sadly, low-income vulnerable communities. But because of our system and our country, it affects all of us. Because what has happened with these systemic deep issues, it's now happening to all of us through climate change. And also from pesticide exposure. I've been working with the black community in South Apopka for 22 years. And they used to tell me, when the white people's kids start getting autism and learning disabilities, then they're going to start to do something about it. But when it's just black kids and brown kids that are having pesticide exposure and having learning disabilities, then they're not doing anything about it. And what's happening now? We hear a whole lot about autism disorder, and there's lots of efforts to it now. I'm getting off the subject. But it's really important that you understand this, the deep racism in our, in our system. Okay, so let me see if I can do this. So this is agricultural exceptionalism, and that's what I was saying before. Not only are farm workers excluded from labor laws, um, but they're also excluded from OSHA. So OSHA regulations uh, um, cover almost all other workers, right? But for farm workers, this is, yeah, this is what I was talking about before, um, but for farm workers, OSHA, Oh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, for those, okay. Um, they have regulations related to toxic chemicals, and they have regulations related to other kind of workplace safety things. For farm workers, OSHA's big thing is they say, oh, just have a safe, healthy workplace. Okay? So I'm kind of dumping around here, but... So one of the things that the Farm Worker Association is doing, and this relates to climate change, one of the things that we're doing is that we're part of a national campaign led by Public Citizen, Farm Worker Justice, and United Farm Workers, but we're part of it. We're part of a national campaign to try and pressure OSHA to make heat stress protection regulations, not recommendations, but regulations to protect farm workers and all outdoor workers from heat stress. Because right now, it's a problem, but you know how hot it is outside. Imagine, one of my coworkers today came in the office, and he used to be a farm worker. Luckner, he's Haitian. He, used to, he said, man, it's hot out there. I said, I just walked from my car to the office, and I'm sweating bullets. And we both looked at each other and said, yeah. Imagine working out there. And in central Florida, we have a lot of greenhouses and nurseries. So we do have food crops, but one of the biggest crops in central Florida are ornamental plants. You don't even think about that. That's an agricultural crop. But if you go to a, floor, if you go to a, a, a nursery, you go, oh, I'm going to buy some nice plants from my yard. They probably came from nurseries where farm workers worked. And they worked in greenhouses. Well, you know how hot it is just to walk outside. Imagine being inside a greenhouse all day long in these temperatures just so that you can make enough money to feed your family. So these are the very real conditions. So we are part of this national campaign to pressure OSHA to make heat stress regulations to protect all outdoor workers, and especially farm workers, from heat exposure. Uh, I think it was the beginning of this year, The Lancet, which is the journal of the um, American Public Health Association, The Lancet came out with a big report about climate change and heat and how heat was affecting the world. And they had a whole chapter in there. They actually invited us to come speak at a panel about farm workers and heat because they had a whole chapter in there specifically on occupational effects of exposure to heat and what that was doing to outdoor workers. 
So if some farm workers during the off season might go and work in construction, or they might go and work in roofing. Roofing, roofing. Imagine roofing in the summertime in the heat. People need new roofs in the heat, right? Because it rains and you need a new roof. So you work in the, on roofing in the summertime and the, the movie that you saw, the film that you saw, that was a, a scientific research study that the Farm Worker Association did with Emory University, where we studied 240 farm workers over three, day, three days each person in five different areas of the state. Okay, and we looked at their at their um, their temperatures. Okay, and we're using some of that data to try and pressure OSHA. Um, but we saw just what that was happening to farm workers, and what they didn't say in the film was that most of, uh, I don't forget what the percentage was, but a high percentage of farm workers experienced acute kidney injury at least one point during the day on the days that they work there. You say, what's got, got to do with the kidneys? Well, farm workers didn't, couldn't drink water. Sometimes farm workers wear diapers to work. Why? Because they don't have time to stop and drink water or stop and go to the bathroom. The bathroom could be a quarter of a mile away. And they're working by how, they get paid by how much they harvest, not by the hour. So they tell us, we tell people, you need to drink water. Oh, I can't stop and drink water. I gotta work. I don't have time to stop and drink water. So they wear diapers or they don't drink so they don't have to go to the bathroom. So these are some of the reali realities that we're dealing with. And we need to protect workers because not only is it morally right and a human right issue, but it's a public health issue. Because we have people that are going to, and, and actually we're, f we're seeing it now, that a lot of farm workers when they get older have kidney disease. And when we were doing this study with Emory University, we did, we did a summertime study and we tried to do winter controls to show the difference between the summertime heat and the winter heat. Well, it was too hot. <laughs> the winters were so warm here that the, four y the three years that we did it, there was really very little temperature differentiation between the summertime temperatures and the winter temperatures. So. I'm going to go on here. This is, again, about the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards, uh, how they're uh, um, not in ha um, OSHA. This is a little bit about, so not only are farm workers, they're usually very low income. They're the least contributors to climate change because they don't have big fancy houses and lots of air conditioning and lots of electronics and they don't travel long distances. Um, but they're also the most vulnerable to climate change because they live in very poor housing conditions. Last, it, when Irma hit, Hurricane Irma two years ago, um, Hurricane Irma not only caused lots of damage to farm worker housing, but it wiped out the crops. So some people might have been out of electricity for two weeks, but then they could go back to work. A lot of farm workers had to wait six, six weeks until a new crop was ready to harvest before they could work again. And in the meantime, they lost their housing. And so they had to continue to pay for some place to live, and yet they had no work. So I am going to get to some happier stuff, so hang on. I know this is depressing. We're going to end on a much happier note, I promise. Um, but um, yeah, so this just shows you about um, that a lot of farm workers live in private housing. Um, some live in um, uh, um, uh, government-owned housing or um, labor camps. This is some of the conditions of the housing that you can see. And you can see that they're not very, um, vul they're vulnerable to um, disaster. I'm gonna skip some of this stuff, but you can see what it looks like in the fields. And these are actually pictures of, and so farm workers are um, exposed to heat stress, pesticide exposure, and they have reproductive health issues. This is about the Los Sierra Sole study, which you saw the film um, about. And these are some of the um, symptoms. Excessive sweating, headache, dizziness, muscle cramps, nausea, vomiting, confusion, and the ultimate um, um, end point for some people, unfortunately, has been death. 
So not only is the Farm Worker Association involved in this nationwide campaign to try and get um, protections for farm workers and all outdoor workers from heat stress, and this is where you come in, we also, um, last legislative session, we had a bill in the state legislature asking the state of Florida to pass heat, st heat stress protections for farm workers and all outdoor workers. So as part of the hive, that's one thing that you all might want to consider doing is support that bill when it comes up in the next session because we're also going to be meeting with um, um, uh, policymakers to try and ask them to sponsor and co-sponsor that bill. Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead. Huh? So this is all really heavy stuff, right? And there's been real abuses against farm workers for not even decades, but generations. So what do we see here? We see, you know, the, the equation we're making here is we have agriculture being one of the biggest contributors to climate change. That affects the whole world not just farm workers, it affects the whole world and all of us, okay? And then we see the people in our food system as being some of the most affected by the abuses and the systemic problems in our agricultural system. And we've been fighting for farm worker rights for decades and decades and decades, so what do we do now? Instead of trying to fight this huge, mega monolith of agriculture, we gotta start from the bottom and transform it. So that's also where you come in. Because what our organization is doing now is we have adopted agroecology and food sovereignty as part of our platform and part of our policies. And we not only teach farm workers about it, we not only teach other people about it, but we're practicing it. So we have five offices in the state of Florida and four of our offices have community gardens. But for us, the community gardens are much more than just about growing food. It's about resistance against corporate agriculture. It's a resistance against this industrial agricultural system that's polluting our planet, causing global warming, and abusing people, not only farm workers, but all of us, and animals. So it's about resistance, and it's about fighting back against corporate agriculture that's trying to control us. That's what we teach people when we do our community gardens. We teach agroecological principles, and what's so totally cool about it is that our gardens are multi-ethnic, so we have people from Haiti, from Guatemala, El Salvador, African American, that bring their own ancestral knowledge to the community garden and they share it with each other. Linda Lee, African American farm worker from Lake Apopka would say, oh, you know, over there down on 13th Street, there used to be this big field and there used to be this one wild plant there. And my dad used to use it to cure this or that in the, in when we had our hogs but it's gone now because that feels no longer there. But she has this knowledge. And if we don't capture that knowledge now, we're gonna lose it. Just like the indigenous people have, ha, of, of, the, of this country and all around the world have passed down knowledge, we have people in our communities that have that knowledge from their countries and we have to capture it now and pass it on to the next generation. So that's what our agroecology program is all about. And we don't talk about food security, because you hear a lot about food security. Oh, we've got to have food security these days. Sorry, fo food security ain't good enough, okay? Because you can give people food to eat, but that doesn't give them power, okay? You've got to give people power, power over their own food system. We need power over our own food system. We don't need Bayer and Monsanto giving us GMO products and telling us what pesticides we can and can't use. We need to have sovereignty over our own food system and we need to take it back. So we're all about food sovereignty, not food security. That's about giving people access to land 
and access to the means to grow their own food. It might be small, but you know what? It's a movement. Because it's happening in Apopka, and it's happening in Felsmere, and it's happening in Detroit, and it's happening in Los Angeles, and it's happening in the Central Valley in California, and it's happening in other countries, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to build a global movement, a, a local movement, a national movement, and a global movement to take back our agricultural system from the corporate giants that are polluting the planet. So climate change and agriculture and farm workers all come together, it all intersects. And when, we, and when we protect the least, in the long run we protect all of us. So I'm gonna end with one last thing because I could talk for a long time and I won't do that. But I wanna say one last thing to, to, to be hopeful, okay? So the Farm Worker Association, um, we're, we're members of the, oh, well, I gotta talk to you about this. So I, I said I was done, but I'm not done. Okay, so um, we also talk about climate justice. We don't talk about just climate change. Climate justice means giving power back to the grassroots groups, okay? Because you'll hear big green groups or you'll hear governments talking about cap and trade, uh-uh. Cap and trade, no. That's, 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 again, big corporations taking control. We need to go b way beyond cap and trade. We have, to, we have to find new solutions, again, that brings it home to the local communities where local communities have control. So we are part of the Climate Justice Alliance, and we're looking for a just transition. And a just transition is when the people have control, and it's not governments, and it's not corporations that are running the show. So we have been, this is, to me, this is really super exciting for the past, year, I think. We've been part of this process where we've worked with some other organizations around the country, everything from a few of the big green groups, I think Sierra Club's been part of it and Friends of the Earth, but also some very grassroots groups, some, um, some groups that work on pollinator issues, some groups that work on um, food issues, Climate Justice Alliance, Heal Food Alliance. Um, we've been looking at the Green New Deal and how the Green New Deal doesn't address agriculture, or very, very, it's very minimally addresses agriculture. So over a period of about five or six months, we wrote a letter to Congress that's saying no Green New Deal goes anywhere if it doesn't look at one of the root causes of climate change, and that's the agriculture and food system. So we have a totally awesome letter. It was really like 10 pages and we whittled, whittled it down to four pages. I have a copy of it here. We sent the letter to Congress and then in a couple of weeks, I don't know exactly when, we're gonna have a press event to um, reveal our letter about the Green New Deal um, to the public. So there's a lot you can do and I think I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions. So the last thing I wanna say is, okay, we're gonna do the farm worker um, chant, and you can all do it with me, okay? You ready? Three times, really loud, really powerful, because you have the power, and you've gotta take the power. So you ready? Three times. Si se puede, si se puede, si se puede. One more, si se puede. Thank you very much. <laughs>